Brothers and sisters, as we prepare to worship the Lord this morning, hear this call to worship from Psalm 34. Psalm 34, beginning at verse 1. This is what God's word says. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Brothers and sisters, let us exalt the name of our great God together. Father, we plead with you that you would help us to do that as much as we would prefer to be doing that together. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to make the best of our circumstances, knowing that, that you have ordained every single one of our days before one of them was formed. And so help us to find joy. Take joy in you, our King. Help us to do that. Help us to honor you. Make us more like Jesus and give us um, just a, a great sense of your presence with us. We pray and ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Brothers and sisters, let's worship God together. John 13, verses 13 to 15. You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. 
If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. This is Jamal. I'm going to be reading 1 Peter 4, verse 10. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace.
for you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. Hey, what's going on, everybody? It's Pastor Hassan. I'm the pastor of Thistletown Baptist Church in Rexdale in the west end of Toronto. And we are back online um, exclusively. Yeah, um, at least for the next three Sundays. Um, unfortunately, given the latest round of COVID restrictions, we are not able to meet together here at the church in person. And uh, while I'm definitely thankful for this platform, this technology, being able to post sermons online and live stream services when we have the opportunity to do that, I, I do not like things being the way that they are. I'm not a fan at all uh, of not being able to meet with my church family in person. Like, I, I miss y'all. And, um, but be that as it may here we are and we want to make the most of the opportunities that we have and the different means that we have um and, and be thankful i'm trying to remind myself like like first thessalonians 5 verse 18 says that that we are to give thanks in all circumstances for this is the will of god in christ jesus for you. God's will for us as his people is that regardless of our circumstances, we would have hearts that are full of, of thankfulness. And so I'm, I'm, I'm working on that. I'm, I'm trying to be trying to be thankful. But but if, if I actually slow down long enough to, to think about it, it's like, wait a minute, like even in the worst set of circumstances, it's still true that God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Like, there's not a set of circumstances in the world that, that can change that. Like our circumstances can't change the fact that, that we are in Christ. Our, our position is secure. And, and our circumstances can't change the fact that we've been blessed beyond our wildest imagination. And so I want to remind myself of that. I want to remind you of that, brothers and sisters. We, we cannot forget that. And see, we, we all know that, that life is hard sometimes. And we all are quick to say, you know, God is good. So we know life is hard sometimes, but God is good all the time. But, but see, that, that can't just be some cute sounding cliche that you say when you're at church but then you turn around and, and when the minute life gets hard, you, you totally forget that or, or you live as though you don't believe that. No, brothers and sisters, can you say along with the prophet Habakkuk that though the fig tree should not blossom nor fruit be on the vine, the produce of the olive fail and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. Brothers and sisters, do you remember that God, the Lord, is, is our strength and our joy? I hope so. But, but either way, I'm going to pray this morning as we get ready to get into the word that, that we would remember that, that the Lord would use our time in his word together to encourage our hearts and, and to help us to, to live joyful lives that, that honor him. So let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you so much for the grace that keeps us, that sustaining grace, that grace that has brought us safe thus far. And, and we, we just want to affirm that that same grace, like the song says, will lead us home. And so, Father, help us to be careful as your people, to be thankful in, in all circumstances. That, that's your will for us. And I know that that's hard. But I pray, Father, that you would help us to encourage one another, remind each other of that, remind each other of all that we have to be thankful for, all of the ways that you've blessed us. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us to keep our eyes fixed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising its shame. And right now he's seated at your right hand uh, where he intercedes 
for us and in rules over all things. And so exalt the name of Jesus this morning. Form Jesus in us, those of us who trust him, and help those who don't yet trust Jesus to see him in all of his glory. So give me grace as I look to the word, as we look to the word together. Give me grace as I preach your word. Help me to be clear and, and, and truthful. We ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. <clears throat> So for the last couple of weeks, we've been taking a little bit of time just to sort of refresh our minds on some things so that as a church, we can um, refocus on who it is that we are as a church and, and what it is that we're trying to accomplish. And, and if you think about it, even, even just as individuals, it's important for us to do that at times because it's, it's easy for us to get so busy doing this thing or that thing and to have so many different responsibilities on our plate that, that we can start to lose focus on our priorities. So our, our mind can begin to, to wander from the things that are most important. It's like, for example... Now, maybe this is just me, but I, I doubt it. Just, I, I want to give you a quick, quick example. Think about when you're getting ready to go to work or, or to school for the day. So you get up and you start out doing your thing, your little morning routine or whatever the case may be. You're getting all your stuff ready and, and, and you get busy ripping and running around the house. And, and you got all of these different things going on in your mind to the point where you walk into a room looking for something. And you get in the room and you can't even remember what it is. Like you find yourself like, what did I come in here for? I know I'm not the only one that happens to, or maybe. But, but, but then when, when that happens, when, when your mind is so cluttered and you're so busy doing this and that that you can't remember what you came into the room for, what often helps is, is if you stop and just sort of reflect, gather yourself, and then oftentimes what happens in that moment, when you slow down long enough to, to just think about it, you're like, okay, yeah, 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 that, that's why I'm here. That's what I came in here for. And, and so really I want these, these, the last previous two weeks and this week and Lord willing next week Sunday to really serve in that way for us as a church. As a way of us slowing down and taking time to remember who we are and, and, and what, we're, what we're all about. To remember what we're here for. Yeah, this, this, is, this is what we're here for. It's Thistletown Baptist Church, whether we're gathered together here in Rexdale or scattered all over the GTA, what we're hoping to accomplish is, is we're, we're building a community of people who are becoming like Christ by his grace for his glory. And, and, and so what we want to do or what we've hopefully been doing over these last couple of weeks and, and for the next this week and and next week Sunday is is we want to answer the question okay practically speaking how are we going to accomplish that how is it that that statement is going to go from being just a statement to being something that we are actually seeing happen among us and and the answer to that question the first answer at least is by Minus God's grace, it's not going to happen. Like, minus the grace of God, that's why it's, it's there in, in the statement, very intentionally. We are building a community of people who are becoming like Christ by His grace. Just a full-out acknowledgement that without that grace, like, we, we can do nothing. Like, Jesus is the vine. We're the branches. Apart from Him, like, we, we're, we're done. But, but by God's grace, by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, one of the things that's absolutely necessary and essential to building a community full of people who reflect Jesus is we have to be a church that's committed to serve. We've got to be a church that's committed to serving others. And so I hope you got your Bibles this morning. We're going to look at Galatians chapter 5. And just one verse, Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. It's 
So Jemima read for us Galatians chapter 5, verse 13 to 15. We're going to camp out on just this one verse. And from this one verse, from Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, the main point that I want to make is this. Jesus sets his people free to serve. That's it. Jesus sets his people free to serve. As, as Thistletown Baptist Church, we want to feel free to serve. As your pastor, I want you to feel free based on the authority of God's word to serve. So if you're in the sermon titles, that's my sermon title for the morning. Feel free to serve. Since this whole pandemic situation started, like there's been a whole bunch of talk about essential services and essential workers. And, and I'm, I'm assuming that, that most of you, like me, have found that a little bit confusing at times. It's confusing. Like, why is this considered essential and this isn't? And what, what exactly is constitutes an essential worker? But, but when it comes to the Bible, the Bible is abundantly clear about what's essential in terms of the Christian life. And, and what we learn regarding the church is that serving is essential, but not only is serving essential, it's essential that everybody serve. So, so everybody in the church community is, is essential and everybody is expected to serve. That's the way that God has designed the body of Christ to work. All of the members are to be working, exercising their gifts, and, and the body in, in, in doing that is, is to work together to build itself up. And so, brothers and sisters, this morning we want to think about not just what it means for us as Christians to, to serve in general, but specifically, what does it look like for us to be a community full of people that 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 is, is a community that's committed to serving one another? And so here's how we want to break down this one verse, Galatians chapter five, verse 13, two parts. And the first part, Paul tells us that as Christians, we are saved and set free. That that's what's true of us because of what Jesus Christ has done. And then in the second part of the verse, Paul tells us that as Christians, we are saved and set free to serve. And so we just want to look at this one verse and see what we can glean from what Paul says here. So let's go. Point number one, as Christians, we are saved and set free. So here's what the verse says. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love, serve one another. And so Galatians 5.13 starts by reinforcing the calling that God has placed on every single believer. You know how sometimes people talk, even out in the world, people talk about what they feel like they're called to do in life. So maybe for you, like maybe you're working a job to make ends meet, to keep your bills paid, to keep food on the table. But you feel like, hey, this this is not really my calling. I don't I don't think this is what I'm called to do. Maybe you don't even know what your calling is in terms of your 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 profession, what kind of profession you want to end up in or or how you plan to spend your life. And, and to tell you the truth, like your idea of what your calling is might not match what God has planned for you. But there are certain things about the Christian life that Christians are called to that, that are super clear. It's undeniable. Like, like by definition, as Christians, we are the called out ones. Like God has called us out of this world into his marvelous light. He's called us out of the world to himself. And so 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 says, We're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. And now we exist to proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 
verse 9. That verse reminds us that God is faithful and that it's by him that the believers are called into the fellowship of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Even in the Gospel of Mark, in chapter 3, verse 13, when, when Jesus is calling the 12 apostles, Galatians, excuse me, Mark chapter 3, verse 13 says, And he went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired. And what happened? When Jesus called those whom he desired, it says, And they came to him. And I get that this is specifically talking about Jesus calling the 12 apostles, but there's a sense in which this is also true about salvation in general. Jesus calls whoever he wants and whoever Jesus calls, they come to him. So if, if you're a Christian, if you've repented of your sin and, and placed your faith in Jesus Christ, it's because Jesus called you to himself. Christians, by definition, are called out ones. But there's something very specific here in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, that Paul says Christians are called to. Notice it again. For you were called to freedom, brothers, or brothers and sisters. Here in the book of Galatians, Paul is writing to a bunch of Christians who had lost focus. They, they, they started off well, but then at some point along the line, they got caught up listening to some fake Christians who convinced them that in order to be saved, they had to keep certain parts of the Old Testament law. And Paul comes along and says, like, that, that's crazy. Like for you to live like that, that is, is slavery. You thinking that you can be accepted by God by keeping his law, like will actually not get you closer to God. It's going to leave you separated from God and, and condemned. You do not want to go down that road. That's a dangerous path you're walking on. Why, why would you want to do that when, when you have freedom in Christ, if you belong to Jesus Christ for real, you, you have been set free. You are saved and set free by the gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, in the beginning of chapter 5, Paul says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Then he gives this encouragement, Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Speaking about this freedom that comes from Jesus, Jesus himself in John chapter 8 verse 36 says, If the Son sets you free, if I set you free, you will be free indeed. In other words, people who belong to Jesus experience real freedom, freedom the way that we need it the most. And you say, like, what, what kind of freedom do, do we need the most? Well, in that same chapter, John chapter 8, where, where Jesus says, if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. Just a couple of verses earlier, in chapter 8, verse 34, Jesus says, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Which means, if your life is characterized by you just doing your own thing, and not, not living your life based on what God says is right and good, you're a slave to sin. And, and the word is clear that Jesus is the only one who could liberate you from that. Jesus is the only one who could set people free from, from their captivity to sin. Galatians chapter 1, verse 3 and 4 says, Jesus Christ gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age. So, so Jesus came into this world and, and he lived a life perfectly free from sin. And then he offered his life as a sacrifice for people who sin all the time, whose hearts are, are full of sin, who, who practice sin and, and are slaves to sin. Jesus gave his life in our place so that we could be delivered from slavery to sin and so that we could be right with God. That 
is, is what makes a person right with God. Faith in Jesus Christ, not keeping a bunch of rules, not trying to be a good person, but repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. And so Paul is reminding the Galatians that because of their faith in Jesus, they are saved and set free. And the same thing is true about us, brothers and sisters in, in Christ. Like in, in Jesus, we are saved and set free. We've been saved from the penalty of sin. And, and, and we've been set free from, from being slaves to sin and, and set free from the impossible task of trying to be good enough to be accepted by God. We don't have to do that. We don't have to try to be good enough for God by keeping his law, trying to do that, be good enough, prove our worth. Or even trying to keep some standard that, that we make up on our own. Faith in Jesus Christ is, is what makes a person right with God. Church, Jesus has set us free. Remember that. There's a sense in which Paul is saying to these Christians in Galatians chapter 5, let freedom ring. There's a sense in which he's saying like that, that freedom that, that Jesus has accomplished for you, that God has called you into, like enjoy that. Like let that, let that flourish. Like ours, ours is a blood-bought freedom, brothers and sisters. It's a, it's a precious freedom. Freedom that that's meant to to flourish and thrive and we're meant to to walk in and enjoy. If you think about it. Everybody's a fan of freedom. That, that that's what we want. Like from the time where we're tiny human beings like we, we want freedom. I don't really know what's going on in, in little kids' minds, but you could tell from the time that the kids are able to walk, like they want to go where they want to go, when they want to go there. And so that's why parents got to keep an eye on their kids and, and companies make all kinds of things like baby gates and, and other gadgets that are designed to keep kids from going places and, and getting into things that, that they shouldn't. But then even after that, kids get a little bit older and, and even with things like school, like you can't wait. Most of us when we were kids and if you're a kid now and you're in school, you can't wait until school is over. Because in the summertime, there's at least some, you get a little taste of freedom in the summer. And then you get a little bit older than that and you hit those teenage years and, and, and you start to feel like, man, I can't wait to get out of my parents' house. Like I can't wait to get out on my own and... and, and experience some some freedom like that's just the way that we're wired we want to be able to call the shots we want to be able to decide to decide what we do and and when we do it people even talk about freedom as as the ability to be true to themselves and and, and see the irony is a lot of people end up being slaves to things that they think make them free and so people chase all kinds of things, money, power, the usual stuff. Nowadays, it's, it's, it's not an like, absolutely new thing, but nowadays it's, it's a big push that like, people can define their own identity. But none of those things will make you free. Like, like only Jesus can bring real freedom. And, and, and the real freedom that, that Jesus brings involves serving other people. And so after Paul makes this statement reminding us that the Christians are saved and set free because of Jesus, he then begins to give us a picture of what Christian freedom looks like, how it is that we as Christians are supposed to use our freedom. And here's what he says. Brothers and sisters, we are saved and set free to serve. Listen to what verse 13 says again. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. See, I'm pretty sure that everybody would agree that freedom is a good thing. 
But what we can't all seem to agree on is how people should use their freedom, what that freedom should look like. But, but the Bible doesn't leave us to guess what our freedom in Christ as Christians ought to look like. Christians are saved and set free to serve. But, but notice how before Paul says that, he will say that. Before he says that, though, in verse 13, we get this warning. Paul warns us about how not to use the freedom that we have in Christ. So he says, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. And so he reminds us here, church, that the freedom that we have in Christ is not a, a free pass for us to just do whatever it is that we want and just indulge our sinful desires. Faith in Jesus Christ doesn't work like a get out of jail free card. It's not like, okay, now that I trust in Jesus, it doesn't really matter how I live. That's not true. Your freedom in, in Christ is, is meant to look like holiness, pursuing holiness and, and, and service to others. So, so service to God and, and, and service to others. But, but see, there's, there's a, a couple of pretty common lies that people believe about Christianity. Number one, being a Christian just sucks all of the fun and, and excitement out of life. And, and number two, a common lie that people believe about Christianity is that being a Christian doesn't really change a person. It, it just makes, makes them feel like, like I'm going to go to heaven no matter what. And, and, and yeah, the, the truth of the matter is Christianity will ruin your fun if your idea of fun is living in sin. No questions asked. Like, kill that. Like, that, that, that's what Christianity it, it is by, by its definition. What Jesus does when he calls you to himself is he says, hey, like, quit finding joy and, and, and satisfaction and things that don't please God and things that the, that the wrath of God is coming against and, and, and come find enjoyment and, and, and fun, enjoy life in me, enjoy life the way that, that it was meant to be enjoyed in, in obedience and in submission to your creator. And then as far as Christianity being just like a free pass that, that, that people use and, and it, it not really changing people. Romans chapter 6 verse 1 asks this question. It says, what should we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? So Paul talking to Christians, he's like, are, are we to continue in sin so that we could just get the more we sin, the more grace we receive? And then you get the answer to that question in verse 2. He says, by no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? In other words, like absolutely not. Like the way Christianity works is when you place your faith in Jesus, like your relationship to sin changes. Christians will live differently. We're not viewing our salvation as, as a free pass to sin. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, Paul uses a word that gets translated opportunity or the old King James Version translates it occasion. You don't see it translated in the um, NIV. It simply says don't use your freedom um, to indulge your sinful nature or your sinful desires. But, but the word that's translated occasion or opportunity, it, it's a military word that, that means a base of operations. Don't don't use your newfound freedom as, as a base of operations to do whatever it is that you want. So so as Christians, chasing after sin, like that's not the way that we operate anymore. Which, which doesn't mean that, that we don't sin. Of, of course we do. But as I said, our, our relationship to sin 
has changed. So now, like this, this freedom that we have in Christ is, is not a, a, a launch pad for us to sin. We, we don't want to sin. We don't want to just keep doing it. We want to kill sin. Like that's that's what the gospel and, and the, the work of the Holy Spirit does in a person's heart. Galatians 5 verse 24 says, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. In other words, the old us, the old way that we used to live is dead. And so now we want to live in light of who we are in Christ. We want to live in light of this freedom that we have. And, and you can think of it like this. You can think about the freedom that we have in Christ, like if like you're a kid who's old enough to be left at home by yourself and your parents leave you at home for a couple of hours by yourself. Now, you, you can view that opportunity that you have as a time for you to just do whatever it is that you want. You can be like, yes, I'm, I'm about to enjoy this freedom. I'm going to do whatever I want. Or you can think to yourself, okay, how can I use this time in a way that I know my parents would be happy with? That's what we're called to as, as Christians, to use the freedom that we have to, to, in a way that we know our, our, our Father in heaven, our, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the, and the Holy Spirit by whom we've been sealed, they, they'd all be pleased with. And, and that, that really is the heart's desire of, of the Christian. That's the, the, the desire that we have by virtue of the new nature that, that we've been given. And see, because the, the, the thing about sin is sin is incredibly self-serving and it's, it's self-destructive. But, but sin is, is not only harmful to, to you personally, but, but sin is offensive to God and, and it almost always negatively impacts the people around you. So it's not just going to hurt you. It's going to hurt people around you. That's, that's sin almost always works that way. Even when you think like, oh, this is just me and, and, and my life and, and my what I'm doing. But as Christians, we're called to walk in Freedom, not indulging selfish, sinful desires, but rather we are to use the freedom that we have for the benefit of others. And so instead of thinking, oh, like, like what can I get out of this situation? Like what, what, what's in this for me? Instead, as Christians, we're called to use our freedom to serve other people. But think about it. Even though we know that, we know, we know that we're called to serve other people. We, we've been given this glorious freedom in Jesus Christ. But how many times do we find ourselves as Christians like missing out on opportunities to serve others because we're thinking to ourselves, like, man, like this is going this is really gonna cramp my style. This this is gonna throw off my schedule. Like that that's gonna be really time consuming. I'm 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 really busy right now. See, we might not come out and say, like, oh, a need pops up around us as Christians, one of our brothers and sisters, we we are aware of a need that they have. We might not come out and say, like, ah, what's in it for me? But we can think like that. And, and because of that, we, we miss out on opportunities to, to serve our brothers and sisters in Christ. And see, that, that's the kind of thing that, that like Jesus is, is critical of when he tells the story of the Good Samaritan. If you remember how that goes down, that whole situation, you got a priest and, and a Levite, and, and both of them just walk right past this man in need, in obvious need, who got beat down and, and robbed and, and they both walk by because they, they've got they've got these excuses. They've, they've got these things in their minds that they think, OK, I, I, I can't really give the time and, and, and make the effort to serve this man in need. And, and 
the point of what Jesus teaches there is that that's not how to be a good neighbor. Like that, that's, that's the exact opposite of being a good neighbor. The, the good neighbor in the situation is the Samaritan who takes the time and makes the effort, goes out of his way to serve and to show mercy to a complete stranger. And here in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, like we're being called to use the freedom that we have to take the time and, and make the effort not to serve complete strangers, although there is a place for that. But here in Galatians 5, 13, the focus on who it is that we're to serve is the body of Christ. One another. And so what does it look like here at TBC? What, what does it look like for us to serve one another? How are we going to go about doing that? Well, the first thing that I would encourage us to do is we, we want to be a church that just pays attention and, and, and has our eyes open so that we notice the needs around us in the first place. Played football for years and in junior high and high school, loved it. Um, but, but one of the things that the position that I played, one of the things that our, our coaches used to always just hammer in our, in our brains is they used to always tell us, get your head on a swivel. Like, look, look around, find the ball. You want to find the opposing players. You want to know where your teammates are. You want to see what's going on over here. And so we're, you're constantly just aware of your surroundings. And, and that, that's really beneficial in, in, in all kinds of sports and all kinds of life situations. And we're not just looking around, trying to be nosy, trying to see what we can see, but we're looking around with the express purpose of, of trying to identify needs and ways that we can serve people. What if, what if, we, what if that, that was our focus? What if, we, if, if we had a congregation full of people who, who from week to week and um, in our daily interactions with one another, like we, we're, we're constantly thinking to ourselves, not, okay, what, what can I get out of this situation? How does this benefit me? But, but we're actually looking for the needs of others. We're looking out for the interests of others, like Paul says in Philippians chapter 2. And I know that can get kind of tricky, right? Like looking out for needs and trying to identify needy people because a lot of people are, are like they don't want to come off like, oh, like I have needs or or a lot of people are intensely private about about their lives. And so you may not even know of, of ways that, that you can serve them. And then on the opposite end of the spectrum, you got people that like if, if there's going to be any serving that happens, it's going to be on their terms. So you got people that are very comfortable being like giving, or if I could put it that way, giving out acts of service and serving others, but they, they are very seldom on the receiving end. It's like, oh no, like if you try to serve them, it's like a, like they got a shield like blocking you and stuff like that. Or, or like if you serve them, then they feel like they have to do something for you in return. It's almost like you, you, they got to pay you back. And, and for people like that, like we have to remember that as the body of Christ, the way it's meant to work is not like you just got to select few people that are serving all the time and then everybody else is just kicking back, like soaking it up. No, everybody is essential and everybody is called to serve. And so what I would say to my brothers and sisters who are like that, who are just like, oh, they're always they're always serving others, but but never on the receiving end. I would say don't don't like don't rob your brothers and sisters in Christ of an opportunity to serve and, and use their gifts. Like let people serve you like people. You, we know the difference between somebody who's just like, I'm just taking advantage of, of other people. Like we, we know the difference between that and, and somebody who's constantly serving and, and every once in a while it's just like, okay, chill. And, and you be on the receiving end of that. And so brothers and sisters, we want to be a community of people where everybody is involved. Everybody is serving and everybody is giving others opportunities to serve them. Like I said, 
in, in the church, not only is serving essential, but, but it's essential that everybody serve. And it doesn't always have to be big things, right? So like for the last uh, number of weeks, the last, I can't even remember how, it's been a long time now, but on most Fridays, there's, there's a group of people from the church who, who show up here and collect food. We get donations from Second Harvest, shout out to Second Harvest, and we collect food and, and pack up boxes and deliver boxes of food to people, uh, both in the congregation and a few people outside of the congregation that could use a little help. And, and, and so we, we have people that take time and, and make the effort to, to serve others. But it doesn't have to be, he's like, oh, like that, man, okay, that's, that's, that's one, one way to do it. But that kind of seems like a, a, a big thing. Or, but, but we don't have to think big things. And, and it doesn't have to be programs. Like just think about ways, like get your head on a swivel. Like pay attention to needs. I know it's tough because we're not meeting presently, but when we get back to meeting, hopefully, and and get some semblance of normality, like like be looking for ways that you can serve. When you show up here on a Sunday, don't just think, okay, I'm here. Let me sit down on my pew and and like just take in what's here for me. Like how can you how can you be serving your brothers and sisters in Christ? Like that, that's the sort of mentality that we want to have as, as a church. And you say, well, Pastor Hassan, like I get that. I, I want to serve, but, but I, I don't really know. I don't really know how. I don't really know where to begin. Like I said, just get, get your head on a swivel. Look around. And, and, and one way that you can do that is, is just by when we're able to gather together, like keep an eye out on people that... That, that, that sort of seem neglected or, or overlooked. And, and when I say neglected, I don't mean like that that's happening on purpose. Like the fact of the matter is in, in, in churches, sometimes pe people just get uh, overlooked. And it doesn't necessarily have to be anything personal. And, and you just want to pay attention to people like that and maybe gravitate towards them instead of Okay, you sort of always talk. I know you got to, it's awkward trying to have a conversation with anybody now. Like we're trying to, you got to stay two meters apart and you got a mask on and it's hard to hear and all that sort of stuff. But keep an eye out for, for people that are, like maybe they've been around for a little while, but but they, they don't really seem that that well connected. Like seek people like that out and and just listen, like for ways that you can serve. Like even, even if it's just, praying for one another but but far too many of us are are i feel just sort of struggling in and and nobody knows right and so we want to be we want to be diligent in trying to serve one another and 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 look for opportunities to do that so just notice people that maybe seem a little bit neglected. And, and here's another way that, that's connected to that, that, that we can serve one another. So maybe you're a person who falls into that category and you would say, yeah, like, like maybe not necessarily here at Thistletown Baptist Church, but maybe you've been to different churches where you feel neglected. Or maybe you do feel neglected at Thistletown. Like maybe you feel like, oh man, those those people, they they don't really care about me and what and what's going on with me. Like nobody cares. Here's a way that you can serve. Don't assume the worst of your brothers and sisters in Christ. Like there, there's a whole lot of things that can do damage to church communities, and and, and one of them is. Christian people assuming the worst of each other. And so that's why it's so important that, that what Paul says here when he says serve one another, he doesn't, he doesn't just say serve one another. He says in love serve one another. And Christians assuming the worst of one another is not, that's not love. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 7 says love bears all things believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love gives people the benefit of the doubt. 
Love doesn't assume the worst about people. Love is, is always willing to believe the best about people. And not that you're being naive or, or gullible, but it's just you're, you're, that's just a way to extend grace to people. Like, I'm not going to assume the worst about you. I'm not going to assume, like, oh, those people don't love me. Like, like it could just be something innocent. Like, man, we didn't mean to overlook you. Sorry about that. Like, like we want to be, we want to do better at serving one another. You see, love has got to be what motivates our serving each other. And, and love is, is also a means by which we serve each other. And so Paul says earlier in Galatians chapter 5, verse 6, he says, For in Christ neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. What's important for us as Christians and, and, and what marks us as a community of Jesus' people is faith that, that's visible through acts of love. Like, you know, it ought to be abundantly clear to, to anybody sort of on the outside looking in, anybody who comes in and sort of observes what's going on, hey, those people love each other. Those people are, are, are bent on serving one another. Like if we're going to reflect Jesus to the community of Rexdale and, and wherever else that it is that we're scattered around the GTA, like we have to be a church community that's serious about serving one another. 1 John chapter 3, verse 16 and 18 says this. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. So brothers and sisters, whether or not, whether those opportunities that we have to serve one another are, are big or small, like we, we dare not close our hearts towards one another and, and, and withhold like the same love that we've been shown by Christ. We dare not withhold that from our brothers and sisters in Christ. We dare not withhold that from people like for whom Christ died. And so we want to serve one another in love. We are free, but we are not our own. If we have the glorious privilege of, of representing the Lord Jesus Christ and, and reflecting him to the world around us. And so, so I want to challenge us, not, not just this morning, but, but through this whole season this this as weird as it is like even though we're not able to meet like we normally would and a lot of our normal activities are sort of thrown off but nonetheless i want to encourage every single one of us to pray and ask the lord to give us eyes to see opportunities to serve Pray, Lord, give me, help, help me to see ways that I can serve my brothers and sisters. Help me to, to actively like seek out people to serve. But don't just pray that. Like actually expect him to answer. God loves to answer our prayers when we, when we pray in accordance with his will. When we pray in accordance with his word. So don't just, just, just pray. Don't just pray. Expect God to answer. And then expect yourself to, to respond with obedience. And so brothers and sisters, we, we are saved and set free to serve. And so my prayer is that, that God would, would make us a church full of people who because of the freedom that we have in Christ, always, always feel free to serve. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you that Jesus is ascended on high. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you rule over all things on behalf of the church. And we thank you, Lord, that, that the gates of hell won't prevail against 
your bride, the church. Help us to remember that. Help us to live in obedience to you, to this great commission that you've given to us and to this, this great call that you've given to us to love one another, to love one another well. Lord, you said that by this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So if we have any hope of building a community of people who are becoming like Christ by his grace for his glory, if people are going to be drawn into that, one of the things they need to see from us is love, us serving one another in love. So make us that kind of community. Give us the grace and the wisdom to navigate all of the different challenges that come, um, given that, that we can't be together the way that we um, normally would be. I pray that in the midst of all of the struggles that we're enduring individually and collectively, that you would help us to, to hold fast to the faith and help us to be, be diligent in finding ways to serve one another. So, Father, we love you, we thank you, and we pray that you would help us to honor your name and give us great joy as we do it, we ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. All right, brothers and sisters, God bless y'all, and go in the grace and peace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Take care. Have a good day.